Hi there. So this is beautiful Denver. Before the snow. No, there's already been snow. It was on the news last night. It wasn't here, but it was Colorado. That's close enough, right? Uh, gee, what should I say? Um, this is not a wig. That's usually one of the first questions. <laughs> Why do you wear a wig, they say. Um, let's see, what should I, should I, should I just start with questions or should I, uh, yeah, just start with questions. What? I was going to sort of do a quick recap of the Civil War uh, documentary, but if you want me to just start, <laughs> we could do it. It was like 11 hours, but I, I watched, you know, I know all of the Shelby foot. I read all of that. I read the Bruce Catton. That was one of my passions in college. So I could give you a, a quick, quick synopsis, but anyway. All right, let's start the questions. I don't know. How do I do this? I go one side to one side. Is that it? Yes? Pick one what? Where? <laughs> uh, okay, over here. Okay. Oh, I see. Oh, God, pardon my ignorance. Yes, here he is. I yes. thought maybe someone was going to, you know, throw a balloon up or something. Yes. I happen to know something about you that most Trekkies don't know. Thank God. I can't wait. I know something about you, too. Go ahead. Your real name. No real name? Your real name. My real name is Cheryl Gates McFadden. That's right. I was gonna expose that. It was on my birth certificate. I mean, I had no choice. It said Cheryl Gates McFadden, Ohio. So what can I say? So why in the Muppets Take Manhattan did you use Cheryl and now you use Gates? I used them all. My nickname when I was a kid was Gates. I always preferred the name. I never preferred Cheryl because, mainly because there was this one girl at dancing school who was in the kick line with me and she was kind of mean. And I was on the end of the line because I didn't get tall until later. And, you know, I always preferred Gates, but uh, I like them all. They're fine, you know. You can call me McFadden if you want to. But uh, I used different ones. When I taught, I used Cheryl Gates McFadden on all my contracts. Uh, and it was one of those things that when I finally... I, uh, that's what just happened with the equity. But I actually always wanted Gates. And we were sitting around one day on the set, and I said, no, I'm going to do this. I don't want this Cheryl anymore unless it's, you know, a blast from the past or something. Uh, who have you enjoyed working with the most? I beg your pardon? Who have you enjoyed working with the most? Uh, I've enjoyed this question and answer right here a lot. <laughs> uh, I guess I enjoyed working the most with Kermit. Now, do we keep going? I mean, does he get like 20 questions or? <laughs> I got one more. I got one more. I'm telling you, this is a crowd. I hope I, I don't bomb here today. All right. So I guess I got to go to uh, this side, right? Or no? Yes. No one else is here. I'll come up. All right. I have always made, always thought that on a, um, an excursion like the Enterprise is doing for many, many years. There should be relationships going on. I mean, let's get real folks. You don't live with people for three years and not have something develop. Um, <laughs> um, Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> no, um, what are your thoughts? I, I kind of like the idea of, of you and uh, Patrick Stewart having a thing going here. What do you think about it? <laughs> Well, first of all, I don't like to limit myself, you know. <laughs> I never like to limit the scope of the possibilities here. Uh, no, I, I have very much enjoyed uh, having scenes with Patrick, and I think we both feel that it's a very, it's a very good storyline to sort of have things happening on and off. But certainly, I would not want it to be um, such an over whelming, you know, yes, we get married and we do this and that. I don't really, I think that most television shows have proven that's a very tough uh, act to, to keep going on, you know. 
So I, I find that it's interesting just to have whatever the chemistry is. We really enjoy working together, and whatever sparks happen, just naturally it's fun, whichever way that goes. I think we both would like that. And, uh, you know, absolutely. I, I wish there was more of it, just because it's really interesting playing different sides of a, of a character. Uh, but I have nothing against other handsome, you know, be they alien or young or old, it's fine with me, you know? As long as they have a nice personality. <laughs> Next question. Yes, why was your scene so short in Red October? Well, that's what my question was, too. <laughs> Boy! I know, it was very funny. I, I have to tell you, I was shopping in a store in New York last, last weekend, I guess, when I was home there. And this woman in this Barney's, this very ex sort of exclusive -y, just expensive, forget the exclusive, store. And she said, aren't you the woman? And I thought, Star Trek, you know. And I'm like ready to say, that's me. And she said, aren't you the woman in the hunt for Red October? <laughs> and I was like, what woman in hunt for Red October? <laughs> I was in it and I didn't know it was me. If it hadn't been for my friends who said, yes, that was you, I didn't know. Anyway, they cut the scenes. Uh, we, had a, we had a long kissing scene. And another scene, but I, actually at one point they cut everything out and it just started in Washington, D.C. I think, let's face it, it was a man's action film. And um, it was a very long movie as it was. And I think that the reason it got cut was because of the length, that's what I heard, that it just, it got, it would have taken it into like two hours and 45 minutes, which is, it was already two and a half or something like that. So anyway, uh, or else they just uh, didn't think I was a good kisser, I don't know. <laughs> I had fun doing it though. But the funniest thing was, is that I had all the dialogue, I was supposed to be British, and I had all this dialogue, and the actual line, there's one line, I think it's maybe five seconds, that one line was an improvised line. <laughs> so it was like, I have no idea what the accent was like on that improvised line, but anyway. Yes. Okay, I have a question that's probably on the minds of all teenage females in the world. Oh I God, <laughs> let me guess. Uh... <laughs> okay, I... Boys. <laughs> okay. I've, I've heard rumors that Will Wheaton hasn't signed his contract yet for the fourth season because he wants a more responsible part. Is this true? And if so, will Paramount give him that? Uh, I don't think that's true, no. Uh, I think his contract has been signed. Good. But, uh, well, you know, well, I think that the year, though, his contract has been signed. It might be a slightly different uh, thing that's going to happen. Well, you know, uh, he might be uh, doing some other things, too. We'll still have time for that, uh, you know, those Star Trek scenes. Oh, my, I have to go to this side. I'll be right back. <laughs> Boy. What's your name? Tommy. Tommy, hang on. <laughs> Hi, um, I was wondering, or everybody else should be wondering, I've heard lots of rumors of what was going to happen this year to a lot of the characters. Like, is LeVar going to lose his visor? And is Wesley going away to Starfleet Academy? And stuff like that. So what, you basically want me to give all the plots out, like right now? <laughs> okay. Let me just say, how much is it worth to you? <laughs> a lot, all right. Well, uh, you know, I mean, I actually think, and I don't feel uh, that I'm alone in this, we, we all sort of feel that this season is perhaps going to be our best. I mean, I hope that you all feel that way. <laughs> I really mean that. Um, because there's sort of something of interest that even all of us have gotten excited about, you know, for the different episodes. Um, I know that I have an episode, the, the fifth episode, which is the biggest episode I've ever had. It was a lot of fun to do. Um, I end up alone on the ship. Uh, now I get my chance, right? Uh, but at any rate, there are a lot of things that, you know, will happen, uh, but we don't always have, we, I don't know anything more than the next script that we're doing next week. I don't have like, uh, actually we had a few scripts in advance this year, which was a great relief because last year we were 
barely getting the scripts before we would start shooting the next day. This time we actually had a couple of uh, scripts. Sometimes we'd have it a week before we started shooting. But um, the tenth, like the ninth episode is what we're on. That begins shooting on Monday. And then I haven't read the 10th uh, episode. So there you are. Tommy. Hi, Dr. Crusher. You're my favorite doctor. Thank you, Tommy. That's pretty good. What's your sister's name, Tommy? <laughs> She's ready to tell me. What, what, what's your name? What's your name? I win. Hi. Well, are you enjoying the, uh, are you enjoying the convention? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was my feeling, too, I know. <laughs> Next question. I just want to say that it was a real delight to turn on the third season and see you there instead of Kate Pulaski. Thank you. I mean, I mean, nothing against, nothing against her, but I just think you're better. But uh, <laughs> to, get, to get into my question, I, I wanted to know how you got started into Star Trek. I mean, did someone call you? Did you call someone? Uh. Um, well, for some of you, you might have read this. I, I think I've said it in a couple of interviews. I, I was out, uh, I was doing a play in New York, and I was flown out to test for a movie. And I was only in L.A. for over, you know, not even overnight, as I recall. It was sort of, yeah, it was overnight. And I was, I had done the test, and I was on my way back to Manhattan. And uh, I called my agent who said, please go to Paramount. They're, they're doing this new series, Star Trek The Next Generation, and I'd like you to meet this casting director. I said, listen, I've only got 40 minutes. I've got to get on the plane. Please do it. So I did it, and basically, I think I was one of the earliest people to audition because they said, here are three women's parts. You can audition for all three of them. And I said, I really don't have time. Let me just pick one. And I just went with what I thought was the funniest scene uh, literally, that was what made the, the decision for me. The scene that I auditioned with was one from, um, oh, God, the title. Uh, you know, the one with the virus and we all get drunk first season. <laughs> why, why is it escaping me? What is it? Make it now, of course. So the, and I just thought it was funny. I thought to be able to be coming on to Jean-Luc while I was getting this virus and all that, I thought it was pretty funny. So I just did it, and I split. And then, well, yeah. Uh, jet lag. Um, we worked till midnight last night, folks. Um, so anyway, then uh, I, was do I was waiting to hear for a play. I was doing this, wanted to get this play with Linda Hunt that I really wanted to do, which I got. And I was asked to do Star Trek. And at that time, because I really wanted to do this play, I turned it down because I couldn't do both. And I just made a decision. I sort of went with... Uh, I went with poverty on the choice, but uh, I, I at least got to do this part that I'd always dreamed of doing. And uh, then they came back while I was doing the play and asked me uh, again, and they said, we can work it out. I guess they, they sort of just remembered it, me and, and uh, wanted to see if I would think about it, and, and it worked out. So I was really uh, happy that I could do both, and I was actually doing the play, catching a plane, you know, doing that sort of back and forth during the pilot, and I think that also, the part in the pilot ended up being just the, the few scenes which made it so that I could do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do it because I was doing a corset and wig and it was a period play. It was uh, the matchmaker. So it was, you know, jumping from a spacesuit into a corset. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I just have two questions. And the first one is, do you know of any actor that's made it without an agent? And second one, uh, coming about the Civil War, um, if Lee would have accepted Lincoln's offer, how long do you think the war would have lasted? I didn't hear what you said. Lee would have accepted Lincoln's offer for what? How long would the war have lasted? What, wait, you, Lincoln's offer, which offer? You mean to, to, be, the, to be head General of the of Northern the North. Armies? Yes. Oh, well, I mean, who is to say? I, I, uh... I don't know. I mean, when you read different accounts, I'm not so sure that it was ever really conceivable that Lee would have accepted that position. 
I think that he did it because they knew he was one of the best soldiers. Most of the best officers at that time were from the South, the West Point officers. So they had, uh, um, I mean, it, but I think they realized since he was from Virginia, he wasn't going to do it. Uh, I think more if McClellan had gotten off of his butt, the war would have ended a lot sooner. That's what I think. <laughs> okay, enough of the history. Back to Star Trek, you futurists, you. <laughs> enough of this history. So, um, yes? I'd like to, to welcome you to Denver. And I was wondering if, uh, how you liked uh, having a teenager on the set. You mean Mr. William Whedon? Yes. Uh, I like it just fine. Uh, in fact, he's, uh, he, he's great to be around. The whole cast gets along. And he's, uh, he's actually now getting into juggling. He has a friend, which I, I have done a lot of circus skills. I've walked a tightrope, done trapeze. I ride a unicycle, which is not easy to do. If you have never tried it, don't. It's very tricky. <laughs> and he has a friend who has been coming to his trailer sometimes who has a unicycle, which I have been practicing on. So it's actually great. I have a good time. Um, um, I have a, another question. Uh, could I have a hug? <laughs> a hug? Is that what you want? <laughs> I'll give you a hug. Um, this now, don't someone ask for a kiss the next time. <laughs> or a feel. No, no. This the steals with Will too. Are they going? Are you going to expand on your storyline with them? Are they going to like go into the, with Will? Are they going to go on to with the storyline between mother and son? Like, are they um, going to develop? I don't. That? I mean, I I don't think that there's any happening right at this moment. No, I don't think that there's there's too much happening in that are way. Are they going to plan it? Try to develop it at all? Um, I don't know. You know, we always have a million things that we wish that we could scenes we could put in. Uh, but it's hard because we're, there's a little sort of morality tale in every episode. So there's always the aliens and uh, different, thing, different features. Some of our shows, uh, actually the second show of the season is quite a departure from most of our, uh, our shows. Um, it's a Picard show and it's very interesting. Few of, uh, we, we, the rest of the group is hardly in it. But it's very, you know, that's, that was a lot of fun for him to do. Now, I don't know which are the episodes that you all will enjoy the most. Um, there are certainly a million things. I'm, I'm trying to get more humor into Beverly, which I think is, is finally beginning to happen. So far this season, I've had some humorous, uh, you know, little moments. Because um, so much of my background has been in comedy. Uh, I've done it for years. I did it, uh, I've studied a lot of uh, Comédie de l'Arte and, and Clown. Clown in the style of sort of Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy, Lucille Ball, a lot of that. So, I mean, I would love to see more comedy. I'd love to see scenes that just will enable me to explore more as an actress. That, that, that's, it's just a lot of fun, be, be it whatever emotion. You know, I just really, you know, there's so many shots. People, when you're snapping these shots, and it looks like, when I, people then have sent these shots to me, it looks like I'm in a nightclub singing. There's always the shots of me, you know, with the eyes closed. <laughs> And I, and I think, why? What is, it's, it looks so silly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I like to see these, really, because I usually just groan, but in case there's ever a good one, I'd love to see it. Yes. Do you ever feel fatigued after all your working days on the set? No, I'm completely like an android. I never feel any emotion or fatigue. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, I'm just one of those gals, you know. Uh, of course I feel fatigued. <laughs> I, I asked them for coffee right now. <laughs> uh, um, yes, I mean, like last night, Jonathan, who had to get on a plane this morning, too, we were like, oh, God. And the episode we were working on, we're all aged, like... 16 to 20 years or something. So we had all this gray in my hair, and I thought, oh, God, that means i got to wash my hair, which is, does not take five minutes. And I thought, but for Denver, I would do it in a flash. 
This is coffee. Yes. Miss McFadden, when, uh, I have two questions for you. When Jonathan Franks was here in the fall, he continuously did his comedy routine around the card maneuver. And he promised Denver that when one of the last shows of last season would have everyone who's been here do the Picard maneuver, and it never happened. So with you guys starting filming on Monday, and El Ju could do, you know, a little double Picard too, you know. Could you work? <laughs> no, I mean with the whole cast that's been here to Denver. I mean with the cast that's been here to Denver is, is what the deal was with Jonathan. <laughs> Hey, you know, I mean, call his lawyer. You know, I, I, <laughs> I can't vouch for Mr. Frakes. No, um, well, the Picard maneuver, <laughs> many of the actors hate their space suits, let me just say. Um, and so that they are always pulling it down. I got, luckily, I said, oh, please, please, can't I go back to the spandex? And finally, this last episode, they've actually taken it in instead of being so baggy. So actually, uh, um, We'll see, I mean, you know, the uniforms are always kind of evolving a little. And the second, and the second part. I did. I didn't answer his question. I know, but you know, just just pretend I did. I I, I couldn't really. It, it was good enough. And then the second part there. Um, what what's the whole story about first you leaving for second season and Diana Muldaur coming in and then all of a sudden out of the clear blue she leaving and you back. What? Which how, we're. How much about. time do you have? <clears throat> oh, about an hour. Well, that's just, just going to begin brief, to cover. Just a brief overview of it, then. Uh, the story is simply that the, the uh, you know, it was a surprise to me. The producers wanted to go another way. Uh, one of the producers who wanted to go another way is, is no longer there now. And uh, I don't know. Now, wait. I do not know, and this is the God's truth. I do not know if that had anything to do with it. But they did want to go another direction, although... I must say, in the first year, I had wanted there to be more arguments and a little bit more conflict uh, between P Picard and Crusher. But I don't mean like really antagonistic. I just mean the, the sort of uh, uh, in the way she, the, in the the drug dealers episode. You know, the, the two planets. The, that in that sort of disagreement, that sort of conflict, where one is she's going yes, but there's human suffering, and I uh, this is unnecessary. I can stop it, and he's going yes, but the prime directive. I, I like that sort of polemic. Um, and at any rate, I, I mean, I I, uh, I went back to, to New York and I did a play, and I taught again at NYU uh, and directed a graduate program there in the grad school. So I actually had an enjoyable year, but. Uh, then I, I don't know, they asked me back. Now I know that the fans were incredibly supportive. Uh, I was shocked. And it's very clear to me that, I, I mean, nobody will say this, but I personally feel, and no one can take that feeling away, that, uh, that the fans were very much responsible on some level. But of course, this is not the official policy and it might not be true. But it meant a lot to me, suffice it to say, to have so much support from the fans. It did mean a great deal to me. And that's one of the reasons I started doing conventions, because I hadn't done them before. I'm, I'm rather uh, private, and I actually don't... I get, I get uncomfortable in a lot of the public appearance things. So it, I'm getting used to it. But, um, but I feel that, that it was the least I could do, because people were so supportive of me. So there. <laughs> So thank you. Again, welcome to Denver. Oh boy. And uh, I also like to uh, uh, state that we'd like to see more comedy in the series as well. I think the classic episode from the old series with this trouble with tribbles, would love to see something like that on the next generation. Going to my question now. Uh, is he an announcer or what? <laughs> Do you feel that the next generation has a message to convey? And if so, has that figured into your life and helped change things? Or do you feel like, for Pete's sakes, it's just a TV show? Sounds like a journalist to me. I don't know. <laughs> OK. Well, um, Gene Roddenberry, there was a memorial dinner for him last year that was quite uh, impressive. They showed a film of his life, bits of the highlights of his life, and 
truly an extraordinary career, an extraordinary man. And we all said a few words, and, and that evening in the cast, all of us said something. And I thought about it a lot, and I, I went to the dictionary and I looked up science fiction, and it talked really, you know, when you, you're trying to put your words together. And it talked, it said it was science technology with fiction, you know, it was it, the, the, the two combined. And I, I thought, well, that's, that's still not what Star Trek is. And it seemed to me, and it still does, that what Gene Roddenberry has in, in all of the Star Treks, be it the first series or the second series, is he has a very positive and hopeful vision of, of the future. That he believes in the possibility that life will be better. It's not just that it's, it's a world of just alien where it's just all horrible. I think that the philosophy of the Prime Directive is quite an extraordinary one. And I mean, even when you, just watching the Civil War this last week, you really see how if we had the Prime Directive, it would be quite a different situation all over the world. So I think that's perhaps, people always say, why are there so many fans? Why do people like the show? And obviously I can't speak for all the fans, but I do think that, that if I were to guess, I would say that's one of the things that appeals to people is that it's a that it's a hopeful show there's so much that is the world is so complicated so complex we can't even take in all the information that we read i certainly can't i can't take it in from the newspaper i can't remember every name every country who that's been having um political unrest and you can only do the best you can in keeping up with current events it's the best I can do to just talk on the telephone to, to family members. I used to be able to write letters. I used to be able to be much more thoughtful, and I'm not. The world happens much faster, at least right now for me. Perhaps there'll be another period in my life where it won't. And I think that the fact that the people on the, on the ship itself really do listen to each other, really do work with a relatively small amount of conflict. People aren't just backbiting, trying to get ahead of each other, and that they really do care for the... Um, preservation of peace. I think that that's quite extraordinary. And I also think that the, the part of, f certainly for me, I would like to always have the courage to explore the unknown, be it metaphorically speaking or literally. I, I hope I would always have the courage in my own life to do that. And I think that the show does speak to me in that way. Even though, yes, I get caught up in the day-to-day -day level of, gee, I don't like that line, do I really have to say it, or whatever. Uh, I think that there is a greater, greater picture, and perhaps that, that's part of it. Hi. I was also very glad to see you back on the show, and you're very lovely. And, <laughs> but Should I what, believe her? <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but Patrick Stewart is my hero, and I want to know if he's a good kisser or not. <laughs> Patrick, that's the lowest of the low. They want me to kiss and tell. I won't tell anybody else. I don't kiss and tell. Uh-uh. You'll have to just guess. Oh. My guess is yes. Did I think she'd say no? Really? <laughs> Hi. First, I'd like to agree that bringing you back on the show was the best cast decision they ever made. <laughs> And also, do you have any other movies in the works that we can look forward to? Well, I just did uh, Taking Care of Business, which I guess the movie didn't do too well, but I had a ball doing it. Uh, that was the one with Charles Grodin and Jim Belushi. I really loved playing that, that bitch. It was so much fun. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I mean, I really, I, I did that. I also did another thing last year. Both of those I did during the year. Um, I did something else called Beyond the Groove, where... I played a wacky, um, I don't know quite how to put this character. Um, it, it's actually supposed to be showing in England right now. It was written by my friend, the late David Rappaport, and uh, he also starred in it. There's a lot of music people. One of the executive producers was Dave Stewart of the Arrhythmics. It's a tremendous amount of music involved in it. And uh, I've heard that many countries have bought it and that it, eventually it'll be shown here but I have no idea. I've heard stories that they ruined it when they edited it, and I don't know. 
when we when we shot it, we had some fantastic scenes and really did a lot of improvisation. And then we found out two days later that there was something wrong with the lens of the camera and we had to go back and reshoot everything, which is re really hard in comedy, you know, because you sort of try to recreate that moment that was just perfect. So I, I felt our first shooting was better, but uh, I, haven't, I have not seen it. So that's the other thing. Then during hiatus, I didn't take a vacation. I did a play this year. I did a premiere of a Derek Walcott play uh, there were, it was a three-character play at Los Angeles Theatre Center. Um, and I really enjoyed doing that very much. I played, uh, I, well, I played sort of three different characters. I played the one character who's a photographer from New York. Um, and then she goes in disguise and, bec and plays somebody extremely lewd and uh, off the wall. And then later I played somebody who was a totally different character who actually was German and uh, was totally in disguise. Um, so, but I enjoyed that very much. So I've, I've actually been quite busy. Who cares, right? Okay, what's... When you interviewed for the position on this show, how aware were you of the original, the classic Star, Star Trek series that had gone on so far before? And um, were you aware of the tremendous following that, did anyone talk about the tremendous following that it had and that it therefore might be associated with you being on the new show? Um, truthfully, I wasn't that aware of, I could say that just in general. I had only seen uh, maybe a couple Star Trek episodes in my life. Uh, but I have to say that's probably true with almost every TV series, with the exception of Jack Benny and I Love Lucy and, you know, George Burns and Gracie Allen. I, I didn't own a TV for years by choice because I really wanted to read and I was doing theater. And I really thought if I just, I come home and I'm tired and I turn it on and I just wasn't ever going to uh, do some writing and reading. Then I got a television and I've been hooked ever since. Uh, and then the cable came out. And I mean, it was, I was hopeless. The first, finally, my friend said, get a television, would you please? And I couldn't believe it. I was just like addicted, you know, it's like, <laughs> especially in New York where you have about 75 channels. Um, so no, I wasn't familiar with any of that. Um, now I am. Oh, no, but there was not, I mean, it, people would talk about it, but uh, you know, I'll tell you, I thought it was odder the fandom of Star Trek and everything. I, I think that I thought in that first year that it was strange, or before I even started, I'd hear about it. But truthfully, once I've actually started going to some of the conventions and reading the fan letters, I don't find it that odd. I don't find, the, I'll tell you the only thing that I find odd, and it doesn't have anything to do just with Star Trek fans. I, I do think that in this country, there is a bit too much cult of the celebrity. You know, I think that it's something, and that's t television. I think that, uh, you know, everybody is famous for 10 minutes, that kind of thing. And, and what does it really mean? Uh, so that, that is fascinating to me, the whole idea of the collecting of, and I understand it. I mean, I, I collect antiques. I collect first edition books. I mean, there's a lot of things. I, I understand how you, you get hooked on collecting, so I can, I can certainly understand it. What's strange, perhaps, is to think that anybody would have any possible interest in collecting anything that has to do with me, other than my mother and father. And believe me, they are the biggest fans. Um, so that's the only thing. But, but actually, I find, I love reading the letters. I've really gotten into reading, uh, and I like, you know, people will write again and again, and I, I quite enjoy that. I think, uh, um, on the whole, I find that the Star Trek fans are extremely intelligent, you know? I mean, that, don't, I really do. I think, I, again, I think it's because they're people who are, um, I mean, not only is it like a wonderful club where you all know each other and you can have fun and, and all of that, which I completely understand, and, and that's great. Um, but also, I think there's a lot of people who know far more than I do about computers, and my, the, the gym who picked me up is a Japanese major and computer science. I mean, I really feel that I need to know that. I need to know how to speak Japanese. I need to know about computers. I don't know how to, to work computers. So I, I think that there's a lot of uh, things that I can learn from Star Trek fans, actually. So. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, yes. I also like your outfit. It, it suits you to a T, what you're wearing. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, this is a two-part question. Part one is, since I heard you're in, com in comedy, what uh, what comedians today influenced you also? And if you're going to, I thought, if you're going to do any scenes like doing one on the holodeck as a comedian. Right. Well, I've always wanted to do, the scene I've been waiting to do in the holodeck is a tap dance scene. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, I, I was... It, I was going to a prep school, scholarship student at a prep school, very, very snobby, waspy, and then going to the dancing, local dancing school every night, dancing in the kick line, we had an agent. I'd sing songs, we'd go to Erie, Pennsylvania in these nightclubs, work with comedians, you know, and I'd sing Can't Get a Man with a Gun, and then I'd tap my heart out, you know. And I'm thinking, I tap danced, you know, studied it for like 18 years, and I'm dying to do an episode where I get to go into the holodeck, or at least ride the unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh. And, uh, you know, and, and it's always, well, no, maybe Data could tap dance. And I'm like, but wait a minute, I know how to tap dance. What if I taught Data? You know, anyway, we'll see. See, I think Beverly's too straight. I said, she's got to have another life. The thing that cracks me up is for the first, I mean, let's face it, all the way into the fourth season, the most significant character trait about Beverly has been her hairdos. <laughs> now, so I said to the producers and writers, I said, look, let's go with this. Let's have her, we walk into her quarters and there's 20 wigs up there. <laughs> and that's her secret passion. She goes into her thing and she tries on these different hairdos, you know. And, you know, she always wants to see if Jean-Luc likes it or whatever. Uh, I thought it could be a riot. I could be operating on an alien and, you know, we'd have a big, you know, twist up here. They didn't like it. I said, I'll even appear in a wig cap. I don't care, you know. Uh, somebody comes and gets me, it's an emergency, and I walk, you run out in my wig cap. No. So uh, I said, well, what else could we have? Because my quarters are the most, you know, just bland is the word. Troy gets perfume, at least, you know. Uh, I don't even get the sort of normal girl stuff. I, I'm sort of like just nowhere land. Um, <laughs> Picard gets Shakespeare, which is great love of mine and you know all of this sort of thing and I, I think that that's one of the things that I've been saying can't I have a hobby please <laughs> I'll do horticulture I'll do I'll do anything please give me a hobby uh, yeah. also for part two is I never got to hear how, how many people the enterprise can hold do you know the approximate number of uh, crew members and family well you know I never heard either but uh, actually, there's quite a few. I would say, let's see, I should know, because actually in this episode where I'm alone, we're talking about it. Uh, it's hundreds. I would say it's very... It's about a thousand, I think, isn't it? Because I think that there's... There's so many decks. I think it is, but that's my guess, and uh, boy, I'm not too good on the trivia here. Anyway, I'll go on the record. I can just lose my job, what the hell, you know. I've done it before, you know. When you were studying in um, Paris, then in our program it says that you studied in mining and stuff like that. Did that get into any sign language or anything? Actual signing? Uh, well, I've worked with deaf people. It didn't there. I, I had studied mime in the United States. I mean, I did the whole Marceau method, you know, the, uh, all of that, you know, the whole thing, and the walking, and the, you know, all of the, you know, all of the push-pull stuff and everything. Um, but, but I actually got into sign when I taught at the Rod, Rochester Institute for the, uh, techni Rochester Technical Institute for the Deaf. I did a workshop there and lectured there for a while, and, and, um, that was when I started to get interested in signing. But I, I don't really consider myself able to do it. What I have done, though, and in Paris, it was actually just theater. Mine was only one portion of it, sort of a, a smaller portion. We did, um, well, that's not, that's not fair. The man I studied with, Lecoq, Jacques Lecoq, he, um, he believed that all artists had a responsibility to society and that they all should, should be familiar with each other's mediums. So we had musicians, it was basically from uh, people from all over the world. Uh, there were not that many of us at the time and, and uh, only a couple Americans in the school. 
but we worked with, uh, he also wanted architects to be involved and uh, painters, as I said, and musicians, and, uh, as well as actors and dancers. And we did Greek tragedy, we did all sorts of stuff. And we, we worked with masks, which is very interesting to me because from someone, I've done a lot of dance as well as acting, and when you put a mask on, it truly is magical. Every, every major culture in this world has had some history of masks in their theater or their culture. And you emphasize the body a lot more because the mask is a fixed image. And when a mask is worn correctly, when it's worn well, you could swear that the mask changed expression. And that is, to me, that's where it becomes magical. Because when you move and you have this fixed image here, but you're moving the body and doing all these different positions, you know, whatever the position is, that you're sort of illuminating the character of the mask. It's a fixed type. It's like a, a stock character. It's like the bad guy or the good guy or the dumb one or the shy one or whatever. And it's really interesting how you play with your body. Well, now when, you, when you're acting without a mask, you use all of your body. But when you're acting with a camera, I find that almost my eyes have to do what my head used to do when I would ha do sort of regular theater acting or something. You know, you can't, you can't do these big movements with a camera. And it was hard. I actually had to learn how to economize and cut back because the camera is so, it picks everything up. It's so small. And I was used to doing things that, that were, you know, much larger for an outdoor amphitheater or something. Uh, of course, this has nothing to do with your question. But um, <laughs> the sign language, that's what it was, right? Uh, no, I, the other thing was, is we did study something called pantomime blanche. And pantomime blanche is a type of mime that tells a story. And you actually describe things. I'll show you just a little section. This is pantomime blanche, okay? This is like, won't make any sense probably. But you actually are, are, are taking a sentence and you are doing the sentence. there is I'm actually I'm actually doing dialogue I'm saying which with somebody who was deaf could probably understand much easier you know because I'm saying over there is a guy who's tall strong has a hat on a mustache and he loves over there you know that's that's literally what you're doing which is different from Marcel Marceau's mime which is a little bit of different style anyway I won't go on I could but I won't <laughs> you're lucky you. you're welcome um if Wesley does go to the academy, how will it affect Beverly? If, if Wesley's what? Goes to the academy, how will it affect Beverly? If Wesley goes to the academy, how will it affect me? Yeah. Well, I won't have to do so much laundry. Boy. <laughs> you know, I have been telling him to pick up after himself. <laughs> um, well, I'm, so, I'm sure that I would, my, Beverly would miss him um, because, I mean, you know, but she also was, wouldn't hold him back. She would be thrilled that he would be getting on uh, with his career, I would think. But uh, certainly she would miss him. Uh, but, you know, I'd probably just worry more, that's all. <laughs> What's your name? Amber. What is it? Amber. Amber. How old are you, Amber? Ten. Never tell your age, Amber. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Let me give you the first and best Japanese that you do deserve, which is Domo Arigatou Gozaimasu. Because you do certainly deserve it. <laughs> do we want a translation, or should I just count my blessings? It is... <laughs> oh, well, if the teacher is... Honorific thank you can give to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> and <clears throat> it is certainly true. My question is, you've worked in 
three forms of medium of stage, the theater, and also the big movies. Which do you prefer and why? Do I have to be honest? No. Do you Which want do to I, be? Oh, I... <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> All right. No, actually, I, that's, a, that's an easy, uh, that's an easy uh, answer. I prefer theater. Right now, I do. Uh, because there is nothing like having... having a live... You know, like, this is, this is live. Oh, you didn't know that, probably. You thought this was tapes. <laughs> Sorry. No, this is live. This is now. This is reality. This is real life. Uh, the difference is when there are spectators and a performer, even if it's one spectator and one performer, there is an exchange that is immediate. It's direct. If there's, uh, you, I, you just feel it. If you're bombing, you feel it. If suddenly you feel that you've almost transcended something. I mean, actually, in my, my favorite acting, one of my favorite moments, there were two things that I think I will never forget. One of them was when I did Midsummer Night's Dream with William Hurt, uh, and I played Helena, and I went on as, this sort of was a big, a big night for me. I had decided that I wanted to go get back into acting. I had been choreographer, director, and, and been on the faculty of several universities teaching theater. And I wanted to get, I had to get my equity card, and I had choreographed uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, but I didn't have a, the card, so I, I needed to get an agent and get the card, and so I did it. I wrote this friend of mine, James Lapine, uh, and said, please, I'll do anything. I'll do the fat fairy, I'll do the thin fairy, whatever. I ended up, I asked them to make me a huge fat suit, and I had a ball doing it. But anyway, the, the, he guaranteed me a night as Helena, and I went on on a Saturday night, and there were a couple thousand people there, and Bill Hurt, everybody had rehearsed with me. I got to do different things with the part. And it was a magical night because the audience was so there. Everything that the play talked about, the weather did. When, when the lovers had a fight, the temperature dropped about 20 degrees suddenly. We all were worried the audience would leave Central Park. Everybody huddled together. The storms, I had these big skirts and they were whipping all over my head and it, it was just amazing. And then all of a sudden when, when uh, Oberon and Titania get back together, the wind stopped, it was like, you know, the gods were involved in it. And it was really a magical night. Um, and I'll never forget that because I felt I could not fail. I suddenly felt that ev I didn't even have to try. Suddenly everything just came through me and the part sort of went off on its own. It wasn't work at all. Now that doesn't always happen that way. Um, and another play that I really felt that way with was The Homecoming in New York when I played Rue, the Pinter play. But it's so wonderful feeling the audience, and anything can happen. I, I did a play called Cloud Nine, and I had a monologue at the end. I played three different characters in that play. And it happened so fast that basically the, a lot of people in the audience had no idea I was all three characters, because one, one character was like about 30 years older than the other characters. And in this monologue at the end, I sit there and I'm playing an older woman, and uh, she's talking about something very, very intimate. Um, and it was an extraordinary experience because people, it, it would be a different time length every night. People in the audience would laugh at different points and it was totally a sharing thing. And I do prefer that to a medium that is not live. That is not to say that I don't really love television and film. I don't have that much film experience. I've loved doing it. I love doing different characters, and when the work is good, when the script is good, and the part is good, I'm very, very happy to be engaged in the work. But uh, at this point, I, I do, I like contact with the people the most. More than you ever wanted to know about me, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you for coming to Denver. You're welcome. When Marina Sirtis was here, she spoke very highly of you. Do you um, still get along that with her? bitch. <laughs> that feeling she had her fingers crossed no <laughs> of course I still get along with her she's great everybody I mean it's a really wonderful cast uh, I we really genuinely hang out together and like each other and care about each other and we laugh a lot it was during your absence that she was here and she said she missed you quite oh well that's nice well I uh, she she has one of my kittens she has Bobby oh. 
Iris had kittens, the Irets, and we, she took Bobby. <laughs> so uh, we're related now. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, What's your name? Brianna. Brianna. Uh, are those, do those binoculars work? Yeah, sort of. Try them just for a second, see if it's better. Is it better? It doesn't, it's a, you don't like them, do you? Okay. Brianna, what's your question? Um, when you were a kid, did you wish you were, um, did you wish you wanted to be an actress? Yep. <laughs> do you wish to want to be an actress? <laughs> um, well, Ellen, I have another question. <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm not that evasive? Um, do you feel like Wesley is your son? That's well, uh, not in real life, no, but I do feel when I'm playing the part, this is the part we're playing, and, and yeah, I think we have a nice relationship in that way, but uh, in real life, I don't feel he's my son, no. But I bet somebody wishes he was her boyfriend. <laughs> I still wish I knew what Brianna wanted to be when she grew up. Hey, smart cookie, a lawyer. Of course, her mother said that now. Wait a minute. My brother's a lawyer married to a lawyer, so law is in my family. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say for anybody who hasn't seen Taking Care of Business that it is a fun, enjoyable film, and you should go see it. Um, my, my question is, I enjoyed, your, I enjoyed your character portrayal in Taking Care of Business, but I wondered, would you like to have seen your character a little bit bitchier than she was? A little bit bitchier? Now, are you facetious here? No, I, I really felt like... She could have been bitchier? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I actually thought. No, I actually had a ball planer because I felt the word going word was intense I mean she really thought she was doing the right thing and she uh, had no awareness of how uh, obsequious she was to her Japanese boss and abusive to her subordinates you know I mean it was just to be abusive to her subordinates was just sort of the way of things because she was trying to, to make the company good or whatever um, I it's always tricky when you're doing you know there's so many stereotyped women's roles and men's roles in Hollywood and sometimes you can do it and you can really say, okay, I'm going to go with this stereotype and really try to enjoy it. And then other times you try to find something that is your own, like, innovative touch. The one thing that I felt was disturbing, I, I wanted her to be a very sexual being. And some of the things we improvised got to stay in uh, with Jim. That was funny because when he does the thing about here's to tits and everything, and then, you know, it was my choice to undo the jacket and say, you know, he said, here's to big tits. And so I, you know, opened my jacket like, okay, boy, you want to play big tits? Here we go, you know. I mean, we had, we, the thing was, is that's the kind of character she was. It's more like whatever the client wants, you know, to get the deal. But th they did cut around. Uh, I had her as a character who was, uh, I made her a smoker who was trying to quit, who had been told by her doctor to quit, so she would take one big puff and put it out and her desk was strewn with long cigarettes because <laughs> well i actually had had a i had an interview with a director for a movie who had that and i just thought it was so funny uh that i thought that'd be a good thing you know and like constantly smoking far more because they were just taking one big drag and putting them out and i had her she had a, a lighter that was like a tiger but that disney ended up not wanting to have smoke so they cut around it, which was annoying because they, they, any sentence that I exhaled on got cut at the last minute. And it was something that actually had worked well in the character. But that's one of the things, you know, that's, that's what's different between theater. You know, when it's theater, I, if I'm going up on a line and I can't remember, it's happening right that minute. Nobody's going to save me in the editing room. But on the other hand, I can control my performance, too. And I can, I can really sculpt it the way I want it to be. Um, but anyway, I didn't think she'd know. I, I, I think I would have played her just the way I played her. I actually had a lot of fun. I just would have kept in the cigarette thing because it was, uh, I thought it was funny. Yes. Do Dr. Crusher, it is good to have you back. I I is I this Othello or what? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. I hope I do not bog you too much. I am seeking some data, however. 
Uh oh. Pardon the puns, but uh, I have a question, and that is, I think you already answered part of it. If you had the option of writing your own episode of Next Generation, what would the theme of the episode be? <sighs> Send the script, okay? Put my name on it. We'll get. Crusher gets a hobby, is what he said. Yeah, I think. <laughs> uh, I really, I don't know. You know, uh, yeah, something like that. Maybe I could go into bonds like kitties or something. Just kind of keep them small. You know, we. <laughs> It could be a big business, don't you think? Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, it's too hard to answer. I actually have issues, the things that I've thought about. Um, okay, I'll think, I'll think. Um, something dealing with old age. What are we doing with people, you know, if, if everyone's supposed to live longer, um, do they all just stay healthy? What happens? Uh, does senility not happen? Uh, that seems to be a problem that's affecting our culture right now, is that we have a, a lot of people, and certainly in your generation, there's going to be even more. Um, so, what's going to happen with that? Um, well, I think all of the, you know, what's a, this would be a very tough one to tackle, but all of this stuff, it's just, uh, it's so complicated what's happening with all of the surrogacy and the sur surrogacy abortion and genetic, the genetic, you know, who is the parent, all of that. I mean, it's such a can of worms. It's just unbelievable to me. Um, also, maybe it'd be interesting to find out what happened to all the lawyers. We haven't had too many episodes about we'll lawyers, bit this way a bit. Um, we'll fiddle with it but bit. because we're in such a, um, we have such a, a, a sort of abyss of legal things that's happening, our whole judicial system is in such chaos, I, I, that would be an interesting thing too, to figure out what happens when the system suddenly doesn't work anymore. Anyway, you can see why they haven't used any of my ideas. <clears throat> Okay, it's a couple of stupid questions time. All right. <laughs> I like him. Well, I really like him, and I'm sure that he will be back for the fourth season, but do you know if John Delancey is going to be Q again? I mean... Um, I don't know, but you know, I mean, he's so good in the role. I would have... I, I mean, we haven't heard anything one way or another. I certainly haven't. I would imagine that he might come back another time. Uh, he was in Taking Care of Business with me. Uh, he worked for me. Uh, and we had a great time. I mean, he's a really terrific guy. I enjoy him a lot. So, you know, I hope he's back, you know. And another thing, um, nobody else cares about this, I'm sure. How is it like working with Dwight Schultz in that one episode? <laughs> I didn't have very much with him. I basically, you know, uh, put his head in my lap. That was yeah, about it. I, was I mean, say. but there were lots of petticoats, so, you know, it was no problem. Uh, I didn't really uh, spend much time at all with him. He's a wonderful actor. Um, but uh, what can I say? You know, I mean, uh, I said two words to him, practically. That happens a lot. You know, some of my really good friends have been guest stars on episodes, and uh, I don't even see them. One friend of mine who did the matchmaker play, uh, Rocco Sista, was in uh, Sarek, and uh, he played the, Vul the Vulcan. Um, and I, don't, I had hardly any scenes with him. Yes. Uh, we've seen Beverly handle um, death and dealing with people that are injured. Uh, do you think we'll ever see her dealing with, like, not terminal illness, but continual illness, say, in a child? Yeah. Well, that's, that's sort of one of the things that I've spoken to the writers about. I would like to. I would like to see and what happens with uh, someone who's chronically ill, because it, it seems to be a problem. Not only that, there are some <clears throat> uh, continuing diseases that people don't think that young children have and are surprised. Arthritis is one. There are a million children every year who come down with a disease and maybe they could do something with that. Have they ever thought of that? Mm -hmm. Doing something that, you know, maybe Beverly has a friend who has a daughter or a son that has a disease and um, it takes everybody by surprise because they say, well, isn't that a disease for an older person? Well, you know, I think people should also suggest these ideas. You know, if you have ideas, write. Uh, it can't hurt. I'm, I don't know. If, uh, yeah, I mean, you might as well write with some ideas um, because, yes, it could be a valid thing. Uh, it would be uh, interesting. What if Beverly adopted somebody? 
Uh, that could be interesting. What if it was an alien? Yeah, because yeah, I think that might be an interesting show. That basically, you know, then then you'd have a whole different cultural th uh, situation, and yet you, you would be the the parent. I mean, that could be very interesting. Yeah. I don't think that uh, she just has to only be a mother to Wesley. Yeah, because we, like I said, I would enjoy seeing that show, and we've seen the wonderful skills that you have, you know, handling crisis situations. It'd be something deeper. That's what I'm looking for in, in Beverly's character, right. something more deeper and personal. Write the script. Write the script. Okay. Oh, by the way, I meant to say, I brought, uh, this is, a, I suppose, sort of a plug thing, but I did bring, it's the first time I've ever, ever sold them. I have, uh, I, I finally got, this friend of mine had taken this great picture uh, when I did the, the big goodbye, and another one when I did the, the one with Dr Dwight Schultz. Um, what's the title of that one? The Hollow Pursuits. Pursuits. Hollow Pursuits. Hollow Pursuits. And I have two different color picture shots that I've autographed just today. The ink is just drying, and uh, I only have a limited number of them. It's the first time I've ever brought them to a convention, so um, Denver is the place if you want to get one. Okay. Two more questions, and that's it. Where? Just two more. Just two more? Mm -hmm. um, they're at some table. Where are they? The Starland table down in the dealer's room, and that is my autograph on that picture. Okay. Yes. Well, I was going to make this a dual question, but I'll make it real fast. Acting styles aside, have you had any problem? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just you and me. Wait a minute, we got a third act. Wait a minute. <laughs> Find out what happens. Yeah. Being, being so grounded in live theater and all the different variations of that, have you had problems or, or had difficulties or what's bugged you about the New York versus L.A. kind of thing with lifestyle or just shuttling back and forth? Well, I, I miss... Let me, can I the second one real fast? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I cut you off. I'm sorry. Uh, the stories from the original cast and especially DeForest Kelly about being so familiar with their consoles and props that they would tell directors, no, that's not right. I've worked this out. Have you got to that stage with your props to the fact that... I have, but there are always, there are always problems because sometimes we, you either don't have time in a shot... Yeah. Um, and sometimes a prop's not ready in time. Yes, I, I've worked you, out pretty much with all of the instruments. I think I have a lot more instruments than uh, the original. But you made yourself real comfortable with them to the fact that... Um, yes, say, except oh. that we don't get enough rehearsal time with them. That's really hard. I mean, if you're doing a play, sometimes you have a, an entire week to work on how you manage your props, and usually I have one rehearsal. So, um, But obviously it's not difficult when it's just the hypospare of the tricorder, but sometimes when there's major operations and you have a lot of techno jargon... <laughs> Boy, I have had some techno jargon this uh, season. Whew. And like, for example, this was a riot in that um, the transfigurations, when I did the operation on that alien, those words were so difficult to learn. And I had them perfect. We did the whole take and I'm doing it, you know, boom, all of this stuff, the whole operation. But then they end up shooting it like you could have learned two lines at a time, you know, instead of the whole thing. Because it's really hard to actually be saying words that have very little meaning. You have to make them have meaning. And you're using props that you have to make those props have meaning because they don't really exist. Uh, and so it, it's hard when you, because it's a very pressured business. So sometimes you just have two seconds to do a run through and you have this new machinery that you've never done. Uh, LA, New York. Well, I love New York, I have to be honest. Uh, I love L.A. much more than I did. I really actually have quite... Um, I've, I've become very fond of it, mainly because I've become an avid gardener, and uh, I've planted this enormous English garden with about, you know, uh, 80 types of roses, many of which are old roses, and uh, all sorts of shrubs and all of that, and I do all the gardening myself, which is why my nails are not like... Uh, Deanna Troy's. Uh, but anyway, uh, I always have to, I have to watch it when I'm doing those operations and I have the dirt under the fingernails. Um, but that's okay because we have instant sterilization in the 24th century. Um, but the thing, like just when I was back the other, uh, last week in New York, I miss the community. I really felt, I, every time I go to New York, I'm walking down the street and I run into somebody I know. It's much easier to get together, have a cup of coffee, to find out what else is happening in the theater or film or whatever, or whatever else they do. It's easier to walk by an art gallery. It's just right there. The museums are closer. You can, it can be 7.30 at night, and you can suddenly say, let's go to see a play. And it's in a small area. In L.A., 
people have to plan get-togethers much more in advance. It's much longer to drive there. It's a chore to go to the supermarket. Um, whereas in New York, it's on the way home. You know, you literally have to walk across the door. On the other hand, if I were to go back to New York totally now, I think I would very much go into withdrawal from my garden because that's really become my great love. Uh, I really, uh, I really cherish the outside, which, you know, there's, the weather is nicer, I suppose, although I miss the fall and the foliage and that. Um, but then I loved living in England. I, I loved living in Paris. I, I would love to uh, live in another country, and uh, I loved living in Pittsburgh when I taught at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I thought I was going to hate it. I loved it. I don't think I've ever not liked a place where I've lived. And if you have friends, and if you like what you're doing, uh, and you know how to cook, and you can get food, it's okay. Um. Last question. Um, well, the other lady took my question, so I have a comment. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you and the cast on trying, uh, on taking the risk of doing something, following in the footsteps of something that has been so successful for so many years and making it unique. And I just wanted to congratulate you and shake your hand. Well, thank you. Let me just be... And now for the tap dance. No. Uh... You see, you can't do it on carpet. It doesn't happen on carpet. Thank you all very much.